all the things. We're good? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second committee meeting of school safety and cul uh, culture climate. <laughs> We are all of the things related to school safety, culture, and climate. Um, I am so glad to be with you this afternoon with my uh, colleague from the board, Dr. Rivas, and our colleagues online, our students and parents, um, who hopefully are popping up on the Zoom screen soon. We decided to spend the second committee meeting looking at restorative justice and positive behavior intervention supports, the very foundation of how we prevent and intervene in harm and conflict on our campuses. Um, but before we jump in, I do just want to recognize that this is the hard work. This work really matters, and our students are not just experiencing harm and conflict in classrooms, on campuses, but also in their communities. And of course, we know there are severe harm and consequences, harm and conflict happening around the country, around the world. Um, I just want to recognize that these incidents have deep impacts um, that can affect a student, a family um, for generations. And in fact, there is a conflict or many conflicts happening around the world that are intergenerational. And so the work around dealing with conflict, interacting across lines of difference, healing harm is fundamental to changing the future of this country and this world. So I wanna thank the presenters that are coming in today. I wanna to recognize all of the committee members who are here um, dealing with any of their, their own individual um, you know, challenges coming to the meeting today. Um, but thank you for digging into really important topics for the future of LA Unified. And so what our conversation is gonna look like today is a presentation first from um, our headquarters team, uh, our district staff. Um, we'll start with uh, Andres and, and Laura and uh, Paul from our multi-tiered system of support, sharing broadly how we approach the work in LA Unified. We'll have a brief presentation from the IAU, the Independent Analysis Unit, on our um, School Climate Bill of Rights reflection, how the first 10 years have been going and the progress around a resolution we wrote last year. And then we'll get into our school reports. We've got an elementary school, middle, and high school um, um, with some committee questions and conversation along the way. We have a media agenda, but we're gonna try to keep it very tight. Presenters have been asked to share in about five to seven minutes each, and we will have the down timer on the screen um, because we wanna spend the most of our time in conversation, uh, asking questions and having a dialogue. So with that, I wanna go ahead and invite up our first presenters. Welcome Andres Chait, our Chief of School Operations and the team, Laura Zeff and Paul. Are you, Paul Hernandez presenting or as needed, as needed from the team? Uh, welcome, come on up and uh, let's share what's happening happening in the district and why we're wearing these fancy earrings today. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm just going to provide a very quick introduction for our content experts, uh, Laura and Paul, who will support as needed. Uh, to echo what uh, Board Member Ortiz Franklin said, this is the foundational work. Um, a as a district, I think we have strong systems for Tier 2, Tier 3, where we could use some bolstering or, or some refining is in the Tier 1 piece. Uh, I often share that as a principal, we would spend uh, the first two or three weeks of each school year, I was an elementary principal, with our students going over just basic expectations. We took nothing for granted as to what students knew about what was appropriate behavior at school or in different spaces. Uh, and in all candor, that ended up saving us so much time and toil uh, on the back end because our kids knew the expectations. And then it's, it's little things like, uh, the example that I always give is instead of telling a student, don't run, you tell a student, please walk. And it's just an affirmative, positive reminder. These are just very little things, but they make a difference. So with that, I'll turn it over to Laura. Thank you. So we're going to talk just a little bit about what are we doing in a, as a district around PBIS and restorative practices. So uh, first we want to talk about how it's integrated into various aspects of district, district uh, different district policies and plans. So... Before we do that, to, we need to understand what we mean by PBIS and restorative practices, because some people think, oh, we only do one or we only do the other. But really, we're integrating the work around PBIS and restorative practices together. Um, both are proactive, evidence-based approaches um, to discipline. So when we talk about the, the PBIS part, we talk about the triangle, the multi-tiered system, right? Uh, systems, we talk about um, prevention, emphasizing prevention, but also having interventions. When we talk about the restorative practices, it's, it's more than a circle and a harm circle. It's really about reflective problem solving. It's about um, 
giving students a way to take responsibility when something has happened. It's helping um, our schools to build community, to build connections, so that when a harm has occurred, they are able to repair that harm. So it's really integrating both of those worlds together to create the best worlds for our schools. Um, where is it in the district? In the strategic plan, pillar two, called out, um, right here, building capacity of all adults on campus around PBIS and restorative practices. So is integrated into the strategic plan. It's also integrated into the teaching and learning framework as well as the school le leadership framework. Uh, this way it's not that extra something we do, it's part of the whole system, part of the classroom, part of the school. Um, and then it's also in the blueprint for safety. So in every aspect of, of the work around the district, that work around PBIS and restorative practices is integrated and embedded in there. Um, the policy, so the discipline foundation policy was updated about a year ago in November from the original policy that was um, first originally put out in 2007. Um, and so it's not so much that the multi-tiered system has changed, it's just that we've added as we've grown and we've started to, to create um, different pieces. This one added in more restorative practices and also added in um, different tools for us to take inventory and support as we um, move forward. Based on a multi-tiered system, uh, like Andre said earlier, we really want to focus on that foundation because we need to have a strong foundation in order for the other supports to be effective. Uh, when we don't have the strong foundation, we find that we're doing a lot more in tier two and tier three when we really need to strengthen sometimes that tier one so that we more, are more effective with tier two and tier three. So in the district, we, we wonder who's responsible for what. I'm gonna say we're all responsible. In the policy is written out that we are all modeling and supporting the work around implementation of PBIS and restorative practices. It also calls out the, the role of the systems of support advisor. So systems of support advisor is a newer role in the district to support the work at schools around systems. So they are coaches, uh, support, for schools in their implementation of PBIS and restorative practices. Um, what are some of the resources? And, and again, I'm going quickly over this, but we um, have created a Schoology group with over 21,000 members. And in that Schoology group, we put out tools, resources, supports for staff to use to build community, to respond to behavior, to prevent behavioral challenges. Um, every week we put out what we call the daily lessons built on Mindful Monday, Gratitude Tuesday, Wellness Wednesday, you've probably heard of them. Um, so we put out easy to use lessons that any teacher can, can use. Um, community building circle lessons are put up every week. Um, the restorative rainbow which, uh, and round which you see in the middle, great conflict resolution tool. Uh, we have schools where students are teaching students about it. So it, it really, um, we're trying to put out multiple tools that folks can use, a restorative questions think slip. Uh, think of it like when, a, when a, something has happened, it helps to take that child through the process of what happened. What were you thinking at the time? Uh, what have you thought about since? Who's been harmed? Right, so it takes you through those restorative questions. Uh, just a variety of different resources. In addition, there are professional developments that are offered uh, throughout the district. Um, typically, most of these are done at individual school sites, active supervision, classroom management. Um, be, responding to behavior. Um, so far, the systems of support advisors have provided over 380 uh, sessions between August and October. And you can see there's a 99% excellent and good rating. So they're being very well received and folks are feeling like it impacts their work. Um, in addition, the ask was how many folks are doing the work. Uh, we currently have 51 system of support advisor positions, not all filled but we have those positions. 117 restorative justice teachers at school sites and 336 school climate advocates. Um, we often get the question of whose responsibility is it to implement PBISRP? Um, I would argue that it's everybody's responsibility. It doesn't fall on one person and it can't fall on one person. It's a responsibility of all of us as we're, we're moving forward. So there are many folks who need to be involved in, in that work. Um, in addition, how do we make decisions? We make decisions, of course, based on data. Um, we're using the tiered fidelity inventory, newer tool to our district, not newer tool in general, but to our district. Um, we also use the school experience survey, office referrals, and uh, suspension. We use the data from those to, 
uh, determine targeted support, as well as what tools and resources are needed. Um, did that right in the seven minutes. We do have a short video to show you um, how that, what this can look like at a school site. So let's hear from, from school staff and students as well. It's very short. I'm hoping it works. No? I could have a short video. We were having oh. some issues between our students that are uh, Hispanic and our Armenian kids, some of our Russian kids and Ukrainian kids. They were uh, not understanding each other, not um, getting along. Literally, we, they were getting in fights and we couldn't even have them play together. By utilizing the restorative questions and conducting restorative conferences over a period of time, students were able to take responsibility, repair the harm, and rebuild damaged relationships. We are working on um, a Armenian flag and a Salvadorian flag to, to support how everybody is safe. So in the beginning of the year, we fighting with each other, but now we're playing soccer and other games like friends. Beginning of the year, we were like arguing in basketball when we were playing, we were so aggressively, not knowing that we're all equal, not knowing that we're the same. But one thing is that we come from different cultures. That doesn't change. We're all the same. And um, we just we got welcome to a harm circle to help us a little better. And now that like we're all we we just we know that we're all equal, we know that we're all fairly and it just helps all of us play and be in each other's team, not going against different cultures. We had some students who were experiencing some cultural conflict. The team came in and together helped myself and our school team facilitate these amazing restorative circles. We met probably five or six times, bringing the whole group of kids together, building community, um, doing these awesome fun activities to increase their sense of connectedness and community, get to know each other and break down the barriers between them. For me as a social worker, it was so incredible and impactful to see the students from the beginning to where they are now. The final project, they created these amazing posters all working together in different groups and what they shared was so amazing. It's also been so cool for me to see them not only grow together as friends and break down the barriers here in the classroom in the restorative circles, but also as I walk through campus and see them out on the yard. A lot of conflict was happening during recess when they were playing sports and to walk by and just see them all having fun and engaging with one another in a really appropriate and amazing way is so different from where they started. And so I couldn't be more grateful for the support we received at the school. Um, it has definitely increased our sense of community here at Coldwater. And I hope that we have this service moving forward. Um, I just couldn't be more grateful. That tied up what, what we're, uh, we're hoping to see in all of our schools. Awesome, thank you for that, Ms. F. Um, thank you to the team for presenting the foundation of what we're all working on, don't go away. I know we've got some comments, questions. Um, we'll start with our committee members. Uh, we have our parent and student representatives online. Feel free to raise your hand function so Mr. McLean can help us see if you wanna jump in with questions or I can turn to my colleagues in the room, Dr. Rivas or Mr. Shait. Yeah, I just had one question <clears throat> in regards to the let me get that title correctly. The new, um, what was the name? Systems the of systems of support, yeah. The systems of support advisors, how many? How, how many are there, one per region or? So there are, right now there's a total of 51 positions. They're not all filled, but basically um, we have, um, they have multiple schools, each one. So the, it's not one per region, it's, you know, some of the regions have less schools, so they have less systems of support advisors supporting in that area. Um, priority schools are getting a little bit more as far as time in the support, so it varies. varies. Hmm. And, and this is to at least um, help in, and why, why, why were they, um, why did you decide to have support advisors? So, Was there a particular reason why? 
I did not make the decision oh, for okay. creating that <laughs> position, so I can't speak to that, but I can say that right now the systems of support advisors are supporting schools with their implementation of PBIS and restorative practices and supporting schools in um, using their tiered fidelity inventory to see where they are, take inventory of where they are at action plan to further implement the tiered supports. Louise, I mean, I, I had assumptions as to why, right? But I wanted to hear from you. I'm assuming it's because of to assess the adequacy of the implementation of the practices, right, throughout the district and providing support and all of that, so to having one more level of support for all of the schools. I'm assuming that's right. It, yeah, it's like a coach for the schools like to, to support the schools. them, yeah. Um, there, uh, there's 51 at all are filled. Um, is there um, a strategy how to get them filled? Are we looking up for particular persons? That's a human resource question, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, I think we're, we're in the process of trying to, to see how we can fill them. Okay. And then, I'm just uh, wondering uh, if we can um, identify um, particular, you know, organizations or, you know, um, professional, so, you know, um, organizations that we can, you know, help, help identify how, you know, how to locate some to fill these positions. I was just wondering. Okay. Just, yeah. That's it. That's Thank you. Well, that's a great question, and it spurs one for me. Um, for all of these, the SOSAs, the um, school climate advocates, is a particular credential or degree required? Because I'm wondering about the work, and we've been talking a lot about community-based safety. Are there any uh, barriers on the paperwork side of things or formal education side of things that might make it hard for us to bring in some um, experts? So they're different. Each role is different. Uh, the system of support advisor needs to have either a general ed credential, a special ed credential, or a PPS, pupil services, pupil personnel services uh, credential. The school climate advocates, I, I'm not 100% sure what their um, qualifications are and the restorative justice teacher is a uh, creden teacher credential. The school climate advocate position is a classified position, so it's a little bit uh, more open, I guess, in the, the possibility of folks that can fill that position. High school diploma is the only thing required? Perfect. Basically. Okay. Got it. Great. Um, I see our students are joining us. Natalie or My Michael, do either of you have questions? It's pretty comprehensive. Great, you got a, a shout out, kudos from the students. And then uh, I think Chaka's also on, who's a parent and also I think a school climate advocate. Yeah, that's correct. Oh great, we can hear you. Do you have any questions or anything you wanna add? Uh, All righty, thank moment. you. I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in listening mode. Yeah. Listening mode is a great mode for us to be in. Um, I'll just ask one question then to the team on the training, the professional development that's available. It's all optional or is there anything that's required? And if so, who is required to attend any of the PD? At this time, it's, it's, it's a menu of services that the school can, once they work together to determine what their needs are, then they can select what professional development they need at the school. That's, that's typically what we're doing now. Okay, it would be helpful to get a follow-up at some point of you know which of these sessions are the most popular, how many are, uh, how many schools are requesting them, are we doing any of these for families or is it just for staff? Um, a little bit of that information could be helpful as a follow-up. Okay, and we do have families, so we we I don't have that number with me, but we could definitely follow up on number of sessions we've provided to families. Great. Another question uh, for the resources on that were you uh, listed the daily lessons, the weekly community buildup. So these you mentioned, there's a multiple tools, easy to use. Are we um, looking to see how effective they are? How many schools are using? Who's using it? How is it effective? Because it seems like there there are a lot of tools, and they can all be all effective. But is one more effective than another? Particularly in, in certain um, situations, different behaviors, different sort of. Um, um, if it's bullying, or if it's a different type of violence, um, if it's school management tool, is it more like a school-wide tool? So just then we have so many tools, classroom tools, school-wide tools, right, community as well. So it'd be, it will be um, at least interesting for me or to, um, to know what are the different tools. Um, maybe this may be an IUU who, to do their research um, to see which of, of all of these sort of resources or uh, programs um, are most effective, and which just to understand, I know we're going to have three examples here, but just to see it district-wide data and um, 
how widespread the, the different tools are being used, or maybe there's some that are not being useful. So it's just good to understand at the school site level from the teachers who are, um, and, and the schools who are implementing these programs, which are the best, um, just so we have, um, yes, it's good to have a lot of tools, but which are the most effective, right? Exactly. We, it's, it's good to have indicators of effectiveness. If we can have those, if we can really explore what are the indicators that we're looking for, in particular each one of these resources, and, and how, it, uh, how are those indicators are informing us on which of the tools are most effective. Yeah, and how, how we kind of adjust. I think you, because the, the daily lessons started out, it was all on one sheet of paper, or one document, and it was like five pages long. And so the feedback we got was like, this is kind of hard. They're good, but it's kind of hard. So they're now Google Slides. So every day is its own Google Slides. So, it te so taking people's feedback and then adjusting what we're doing right. to and, meet their needs. And I'm, I mean, me, I'm thinking just as a student, like some of them may be not as effective, right? right? So I was like, we're using it every day, every year. So I was like, oh, yeah, we're doing that again. Oh, right. Right? right? So how can we uh, continue to add more resources to keep the students engaged, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, one thing I was thinking, I don't know if this is part of this presentation or another one, is in developing positive youth um, development programs, right? That take, that's another level where we're, um, moving, maybe connecting the student more to like uh, projects in the community besides just beautification, but something more that engages the student, particularly those students that you've tried every tool, m maybe there's something else that we can do, engaging with the community, connecting with other relationships outside of the school, but still are connected to, you know, what we want effective, yeah. and it, just a thought. Well, thank you so much. Thank I you. really appreciate the foundation. And next, we're going to hear from our independent analysis unit. Mr. Andrew Thomas is coming on up. Last year, the board unanimously approved a um, resolution looking back on the 10 years of the School Climate Bill of Rights, which committed us to restorative justice. And so a uh, big part of feedback we heard from community partners was, what does that look like in our schools? What data do we have? What um, qualitative and quantitative information can we share about how the 10 years of restorative justice have been going? So Mr. Thomas, what did you all find? Good afternoon, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for that introduction. It was, it's kind of my first slide. So that, yeah, that's what we did. We, we were evaluating the School Climate Bill of Rights. Today, I'm just gonna be talking about PBIS, positive behavior interventions and supports and restorative justice part of it, restorative practices. Um, and again, we're trying to look at exactly what it looks like in the schools. So we have policies, programs, and procedures in place, but you have to go into the schools to figure out who's adopting them, who's not adopting them, where they're working, where they're not. So let me see if I can make this. Okay, so we looked at three kinds of information. One is district suspension data. One is district discipline data, which is the office discipline referrals. But then we realized that that wouldn't tell us the whole story. So we, we did a principal survey and a teacher survey. And, th and those were random sample surveys. I won't talk much about the methods because it's too technical. <laughs> you can ask questions about that later. But we do feel uh, confident that our, uh, our results represent what most teachers, what, what most principals experience in, uh, and uh, do in the schools. We asked, three, uh, or we asked four research questions. Uh, what were teachers and principals' attitudes? How often do they use these restorative practices? And what training and supports uh, are they using? So that goes to the SOSA and the, and the professional development. And then what challenges do they face in implementing uh, positive behavior supports and restorative practices? And just very briefly, uh, we looked at suspension data over time, just to, just to put in context that restorative practices are situated within a broad shift in discipline policy over the last two decades. So there was a discipline foundation policy that Laura mentioned in 2007, all the way up to the update in 2002, and restorative justice training began in 2015. And you can see that, that suspensions have dropped dramatically since then. So that's, that's what's going on with suspensions. Now, there are still disparities, but that's an issue we can talk about later between different groups. So then we wanted to ask about principal buy-in and teacher buy-in and uh, confidence in restorative practices. And um, we asked a series of questions and we averaged the results and we found that principals report significantly higher buy-in than teachers do. But both teachers and principals report quite a bit of buy-in. So buy-in is not a huge issue with, um, with restorative practices. And confidence is also fairly high. Kind of interestingly, we asked principals um, if they thought teachers were confident and teachers bought in, and they thought teachers bought in and were less confident than teachers themselves thought they were. 
So there's a, there, there's a, there's a disconnect between what, what principals are, are seeing or thinking about teachers and what teachers are thinking about themselves. And I can, I can go into more detail about the, the information here if you want in the question section. Okay, this is the most complicated slide, so I'll spend a couple minutes on it. <laughs> We've got four major points here. On the right, we have the arrow, which is what Laura alluded to, that restorative practices are really about prevention on a daily basis, man classroom management, and then also responding to incidences. So, so it's like specialized restorative practices and then more general restorative practices. And we ask questions about each phase of it, and we think that we need to evaluate it. You know, how is it working for prevention? How is it working for classroom management? And how is it working? for dealing with specific incidences. So we asked different questions. And the way to understand this data is, is that there are patterns here in how much teachers and principals use these different strategies. So if we look at the left first, we have the gray and the orange. And the first thing we see, the, number, the, the first point here, number one, is that half of teachers are reporting never or almost never using these strategies on a daily basis. So that's... That's something we should be concerned about. Now, half are, but since this is something that, that, that we do want teachers to use all the time, half of them are reporting not using it all the time. The second point is that a, a substantial minority, a quarter, are reporting using restorative practices to respond to office discipline res referrals. So those are the, the, the most serious incidents. A quarter of the teachers say, yeah, we never use um, restorative practices. Now, this is not necessarily bad because maybe the principal is using the restorative practices or they leave the classroom or there might be some other legitimate reason for the teachers not to use restorative practices in these circumstances. Now on the other side of the bar where it's blue, we see on the other hand, the largest percentage, it's, it's, it's still a minority, but 16% of the teachers are always using restorative practices to respond to office discipline referrals. So I think what we see is a lot of variability in how teachers and schools are using these practices. Some are always using them for certain things, some are only using them for other things. Uh, we do find, and the fourth point here, is that principals are reporting almost always using restorative practices when it comes to responding to office discipline referrals. So this is rich data that kind of really tells us the variability that's going on in the schools, and we can discuss that more if we'd like. Now this is, this is very specific data we have from the MISIS system about office discipline referrals. And when there's a discipline referral, there are different actions that can be taken in response to it. And there are check boxes. And obviously the most common is a, is a conference between the principal and the student. Second most common are conferences are, that involve parents. And then way down on the list, only 5% are reporting restorative justice program as an action in response. And I think our takeaway from that is just that this system we have in MISIS of tracking uh, office discipline referrals and restorative practice is not really telling us everything that's going on with restorative practices. So we might want to think about revisiting that system or just understanding that, that these quantitative tracking systems we have aren't really telling us the full story. And then we looked at supports, a couple of slides about supports. Um, and this goes to uh, Dr. Rivas's questions. Um, what teachers are utilizing in terms of supports. Um, we do find that four in 10 teachers did not use any professional development or materials last year. We asked them what they were using last year. We do also find that half the teachers are using the Schoology materials that Laura mentioned. And then one thing I want to point out at the bottom, 6% are, are using this drop-in virtual session, which is probably an underuse of a, of a really good resource. And so we need to look at that. That's a, that's a weekly session that Laura and her team put on for any teachers who want it. And only 6% are, are, are reporting using it at the moment. All right, let's look at the system of support uh, advisors. Um, we found that last year, 40% of principals interacted with these um, advisors, these coaches, and 20, almost 20% 20 of teachers. However, this year, 16% of teachers are already reporting interacting with them. They've been reorganized and there are more of them. And so we're less than halfway through the year and we're already at the level that we were at last year in, in the using of the, of the SOSAs. And um, the orange circles on this slide also tell you that the current use of the SOSAs is higher in a number of categories than it was last year. And then let's look very quickly at this, some of the specific um, 
um, challenges or obstacles that teachers and principals are reporting um, to, to implementing PBIS and restorative practices. First of all, the biggest thing is uh, everybody reports that there are time constraints. It's, it takes a lot of time. Building community takes time and supports, and there are many other demands that fall on the, the shoulders of teachers and principals. And the other thing I want to point out on this slide is number two. Very interesting, I think. There's a lack of buy-in bar there, and it's, it shows that, um, that the teachers, no, the principals, Oh yeah, no, this is right. That um, the principals report lack of buy-in, which means that their teachers they think their teachers are not buying into restorative practices, and teachers, which is the lighter blue bar, report that the problem is really the students not buying in. So there's a there's there, there's a difference between what uh, principals and what um, and what teachers perceive as, as one of the biggest challenges in terms of other people buying into the into the restorative practices and implementing them. And then there's, th these bars are all about um, positive behavior interventions and supports, and we also ask the exact same questions about restorative practices. Most of the answers were similar, except when it comes to the lack of support category. Here, uh, principals say that, that, that the lack of support is a barrier or is a challenge for implementation um, for PBIS, but many fewer principals report that that's a problem for restorative practices. So that tells us that the principals are feeling supported in restorative practices, but less so in, in positive behavior interventions and supports. Maybe because it takes more time, or it's the tier one that Mr. Chair was referring to. So um, that is our data in a nutshell. Our major findings are up here on a summary slide, and I'm happy to, to fill in some blanks or to try to flesh out some of that stuff. It's pretty rich data. It absolutely is, and thanks for doing that so quickly. Uh, I did ask all of our presenters to try to go for five to seven minutes, so thank you for um, being swift. And I will see if my colleagues have questions or comments to add to the rich uh, qualitative analysis you all did on the implementation of PBIS restorative practices. Anybody? I see Michael with his hand raised. Go for it. Yeah, um, so thank you so much for presentation. Uh, I just had a question regarding the ODRs. Is there any concern that schools are inconsistent with how they hand out office discipline referrals? Like, oh. might a particular, like, like, will a particular offense get a student referred in one school, but, like, not in another school? I, I would say there's concern. The data doesn't, we didn't really look at discrepancies. I, th I think we actually did look uh, across racial categories, but there is definitely discrepancy from school to school and how often, and, and from teacher, to, I mean, this is a decision that teachers make. And so teachers who are better prepared to manage classrooms or to deal with things within classrooms, and then you know, some teachers just don't have the same problems that other teachers have. There are a lot of variables that contribute to the numbers of discipline referrals. But I, w I would say, just to answer your question, is there concern, I would say yes. Yeah, great question, thank you. Dr. Rivas. I think this connects to my previous um, question in regards to the, sorry, I forgot the name again, the the new SOSA, the SOSA, yes. Um, in terms of the implementation, right, it just seems from just really quick glance at this data that there's a lot of assumptions, right, different assumptions from principals and teachers. Mm -hmm. um, Different the data, I think a lot of this data, I really want to get, I didn't have an opportunity to really dig into all this, but I think there's a lot of room here to really investigate and to really understand what's, what's, what, what are the challenges, right? And teachers have different challenges, principals are having different challenges. So every single sort of school community member from parents to teachers, in order for all of this to really be implemented, like I said, adequately or really uh, with fidelity, is we really have to look at every single actor, right? We're, really, we're, we're focusing on the student. How can we support this student, right? We have all of these systems of support, which are great. Um, but it's in the implementation and, act and also the context. And there's so many factors that go into all of this that it would be really wonderful to really dig in even deeper into some of um, what you found in these uh, uh, res um, the responses that we received, uh, particularly in the one with student buy-in. Like, teachers are the ones that are, have to work with the students. They're the ones who have to um, implement this and you know see where it's going. But if they're feeling that they're not getting to the students, then that's a problem. 
because they're they're the main you know um, focus that everything. So if if that, I think I would really love to get more deep into what is the challenge in terms of getting to the students. Is it because maybe we have to build in more emotional intelligence? Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not connecting to what we're trying to uh, achieve. Maybe there's lack of trust as well. And the other important factor that I think we really need to look at is the school environment, right? How safe do the students feel? Like, yeah, this, they may be, feel safe in their classroom, but outside of it, they may not feel safe, right? To really, mm -hmm. um, for restorative justice practices or whatever it is that, so the, yeah, I think this, the environment of the school, the safety, um, the culture, and also addressing why students are, you know, what, what are the sort of the resistance? It's just a resistance. And it could be a resistance that came from the pandemic, right? I mean, we're just trying to um, uh, know how to relate to one another. None of our students had that that, that stoppage in terms of connecting with folks. So it could also be that as well, that the students are they're feeling this resistance because there's emotions that they're not able to really communicate. Um, so anyway, those are just some thoughts. But I would really love to like dig into more of the data. That's well, I'll just, I'll just add one comment to that. Uh, just that we did, we did ask a bunch of open-ended questions, so I didn't report here of the, the respondents. And we did get insight into how, some of the worries that teachers have. Some, a lot of teachers, um, no, I, I don't want to say a lot, T one of the common comments we got was that, that kids need to understand there are consequences. They kept using this term consequences, which is kind of an interesting um, conceptualization. Like the old fashioned way, that was consequences. You know, that was like suspensions, that's a consequence. So that's a mind shift change that we need, we need to, to work on with, with everybody to understand that. No, th these, are, these are consequences. This is repairing harm. This is a system that works, but uh, it's a little different than the old system. So, I mean, it, it's a mind shift change. And it's and it, just like you said, it's thorough from the, from the daily practice and the teachers and the students and the parents and you know the families and the principals is all so it's a it's a heavy lift is what it is yeah no, I appreciate that, and I love that Ms. F shared some of the restorative questions because one of the hardest ones that does reveal consequences is what do you think needs to happen to make things as right as possible? And it's not usually, oh, a suspension is going to make things as right as possible, but there is something, and that is the consequence. It's ideally the, the matched consequence to make things right based on the harm that was caused. Um, you know, I was just thinking for Mr. Chait's team, uh, if you would be so willing as to take this data to your, your teammates, whether it's at the regional offices or perhaps a group of principals. I'd be curious to hear what their reflections might be or how folks might respond to this. Um, and uh, I agree, it's, it's a lot of information in a short amount of time, but our hope is that we can continue to build the confidence, continue to build the, you know, the shared values of a restorative approach and to maybe address some of those challenges that folks said were getting in the way of them doing it to the best of their ability. Uh, definitely happy to do that. Uh, I want to offer one comment and one clarification. The systems of support advisor positions are not new. We've had them since 2019. Uh, they used to be essentially part of a menu of support positions that were available for this work. The other most popular one was a restorative justice teacher advisor, RJTA, which we still have. Uh, what has shifted is really honing in on what SOSAs do day to day. There were SOSAs that used to be school purchased, local district purchased, and so on. And depending on sort of who purchased the position, that sort of determined what that person did. So what Laura and her team have done is really drilled down and ensured that everyone understands that SOSAs, they're not the owners of positive behavior or restorative practice. We all own that. But they are a coach. They are a driver on that. Uh, the second thing, I would love to share the data. And what I'd really like to see, Andrew, is this data disaggregated by level. Because I'd be interested to know uh, elementary, middle school, or high school. I have my own sort of theories based on my experience as to where the buy-in is going to be or maybe lacking. But I'd love to see it broken down that way. Yeah, we'd like to do that. We haven't had a chance to do that yet. We, yeah, we, we separately sampled um, secondary and elementary uh, te teachers and principals. So we have that. And I'll just add to your point that on slide, um, I think it's slide nine. Um, it, it does, it does. No, it's not that one. It's slide eight. It does get to to a lot of the things that this that the SOSAs are providing for um, for uh, teachers and principals, and they are getting into more of the direct support into the classrooms now, which is which is a little which is the direction they're going. That's great. Uh, and our last comment or question, Natalie, I see your hand. 
Yes, hi. So mine's not really a question, but I do have a comment regarding the restorative justice practices. And, you know, I feel like having the principals more participate more in these practices at school would be kind of inclusive because I feel like as students, we also feel like connecting with everyone at, on campus. So I feel like connecting with the principal is also a good thing that should be implemented as well. Great point, and that's why we have our student voices as a part of this committee. So thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you for the discussion, committee members. We're gonna now shift to our last group, um, which is really based on the data. So my team looked at the MISIS restorative justice interventions, and we reached out to schools that had the greatest number of responses to incidents with a restorative approach as opposed to any of the other MISIS options they could have chosen. So we've invited Brooklyn Avenue Elementary School, Markham Middle School, and Santee High School to come share what's happening on their campus. We'll start with Brooklyn, who is online, in person. Come on down, Brooklyn. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and as Brooklyn's coming up, I want to remind our schools that we are um, hoping for a five to seven minute presentation from each of you in a row, and then we'll do the whole group discussion afterwards. And I imagine that will be rich and valuable. So let's bring up Brooklyn's presentation. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Ms. Medina. I'm the restorative justice teacher there. I call myself the PBIS support coordinator. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adriana Madrid. I'm the assistant principal. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Gonzalez. I'm the school climate advocate. And we're just a small portion of our PBIS team at Brooklyn. So really quick, I think the first um, question is, what does it look like on our campus? Everyone is involved. It is a team effort, and we make sure that our staff and our students and our families are all aware of our expectations and procedures and our tier support systems at the school. So I think um, just to give a little bit of background, coming back from the pandemic, we realized that there was a big need for student support and uh, social emotional well-being. Um, and so we began to look uh, at the resources we currently had on our campus and then also began to make decisions of what other type of personnel we needed to add to our support system. So we began to make uh, the decision within the next couple of years to purchase full-time PSA counselor, a school psychologist, our um, restorative uh, justice teacher. Uh, we were also lucky enough to get um, positions such as the uh, culture climate advocate and our um, family, resource navigator. Fam family resource navigator, and those were purchased by the district. So together we began to uh, begin to put systems in place so that all of these different positions were collaborating together so that we can provide all the different supports for our students. And just a really brief, like our tier one includes all staff, our cafeteria staff, our custodian, everyone on campus is all aware and all involved. Um, everyone knows our four Bs, our school expectations. There is SEL lessons daily. We, we made it part of breakfast in the classroom to incorporate that in our daily schedule so all students are getting those lessons. Um, and keeping families and students and staff informed, we have um, daily morning announcements, weekly webinars, um, parent workshops where everyone knows what's happening at Brooklyn. Um, and then on our tier one, we also have a lot of smiles and a positive culture at Brooklyn provided by our school climate advocate. So um, every morning my job is to make sure I bring smiles, I greet the kids, the parents. I, I set up the morning music. My job is to make sure Brooklyn is like Disneyland. I give them high fives, I give them a big smile, I ask them if they had breakfast this morning. So what I do, the way I work, I put myself in their shoes, and I remember when I was a kid, what I needed, and every kid is unique, but we can relate. So I just work from the heart. And then stepping into our tier two really quick, we're looking more at specific needs. We try to um, create counseling groups based on student needs and teacher um, referrals or teacher input. Um, we've had like grief groups, especially right after COVID, newcomer groups, um, empowerment groups for our middle school um, young ladies, and just coping skills for anxiety or anger management for even some of our little ones. So that's more of our tier two supports, just focusing on kind of group needs. 
And then uh, something that is our focus for this school year was to refine our tier three supports. So really uh, taking a look at how we're supporting individual students and creating support plans for those students. So this is a smaller population of our school site, but it's a really important one because sometimes that tier one, tier two, uh, there's something missing for that student. So we need to figure out how to support them in that tier three. So that's something that we're working on this school year. And it doesn't work without teamwork and collaboration and working together. So we just have here our school expectations and our behavior flow chart. Um, strategies to keep us all on the same page and to make this successful is, again, keeping everyone informed. We have staff PDs. Um, we have, again, the parent workshops. We actually are doing certain push-ins with teachers going into the classroom like just reviewing community building circles, reviewing restorative practices with them. And so we just wanna make sure that we're going over um, for the four to one and um, reviewing expectations and behavior. The whole school has Brooklyn books so we pass out to reinforce positive behavior. Yeah, so it's just having that um, universal language. So we all have that same language and we all use it. And so we are encouraging our parents also to use it. So when they're looking at how to, you know, to talk to their students about different situations, is like, were you being kind? Were you being respectful? What does that look like? Were you being safe? Were you being responsible? So having that common language at home and at school so that we could all be on the same page. Our success comes from promoting that positive school environment. Um, just the morning greetings, daily check-ins. Some of us have specific students that we're checking in with on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, counseling groups at their, to support their needs. Um, keeping everyone informed with our webinars, our morning announcements. Implementing restorative rounds. Even out in the yard, our supervision staff is being trained on how to resolve conflicts out on the yard. And we have an inviting wellness room that we've created where if students need a space to calm down or talk about their feelings, they know who they can go to and where to go. And then also teachers know where to find that support. So it's really important, you know, um, our SOSA has been um, working with us since last school year and he's been doing uh, parent workshops for our uh, families. He's been working with our classified staff on how to, uh, you know, talk to the students, how to motivate the students. We've been doing book studies with our classified staff, so we've done different, um, different books. Last year, we're choosing a new book uh, this year, for example, The Energy Bus for Adults. So it's something that we're reading together, and how does this you know, motivate us to, to continue to build that positive um, environment? And so all of this has led to do you want to, us uh, over the past four years. So this didn't happen over one year or overnight. It's been a work. I've been there. This is starting my fourth year. I know our principal, Ms. Martinez, has been there now for five years. So this has been an uh, ongoing process. And last year, we, uh, after we were looking at the TFI, looking at our scores, we decided to apply for our um, uh, gold implementation award, which we did receive. So um, we're really proud of that. And that's just. <laughs> This goes to, uh, to validate like all of the hard work that's been happening for the past four years. And then just again, overall with our looking at our data, it really shows that with our staff, it's they're, it's they're doing more conflict resolution with the students themselves before it turns into a disciplinary action or disciplinary referral. And then Ms. Martinez, do you want to step in? <laughs> I'm always the challenge person. <laughs> So, um, good afternoon. Please excuse. We had a school site council meeting that I had to attend. Um, my name is Marisa Martinez, and I'm the proud principal at Brooklyn Avenue School, servicing our UTK through eighth grade. So, our challenges with uh, there, there are no challenges to creating a positive school culture. The challenge is how do we maintain the resources, right? We all want to do this, but how do we sustain the resources needed? to have the supports for positive behavior. So time is probably the one that we're always fighting for is as a leader, my job is to protect the positive behavior team to meet, to make sure that they're consistent in meeting um, and that everyone is available to meet. The other one is staff involvement and buy-in. I hate the word buy-in, but it really is a shifting of a mindset. The average teaching years at Brooklyn Avenue is over 20, 25 years average. So you're really talking about the old school way of handling behavior and to how we shift to a restorative manner. And it really doesn't happen overnight. I can put policy in place, but the mindset has to also shift. So that has taken time. 
um, from when I first started students who were being benched to now doing restorative circles in the classroom has been the shift. Um, and it's been through practice. And then obviously funds is always something that I'm concerned about as a school principal is I'm always waiting in anticipation what allocation we will receive um, during February so that I know what we can afford. Um, so RJ teacher is a position that I would love to continue to fund for our school site because it has shifted the time that we can dedicate to being proactive and it has shifted the time that we can dedicate to conflict resolution. We're also last the first uh, two years ago, we were allocated a family resource navigator. Now we have to purchase it from our own funds. Um, and then also our school climate advocate, who we was just highlighted in LA schools yesterday, is also a position that, um, that right now is being allocated by the district to us. However, she let me know that this might be the last year based off of what was told. To, what, what did they tell you? Uh, they said So my position was funded for three years. Uh, this might be my last year. It's up to the admin to find funding. <laughs> and I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if school climate advocates will continue to be funded for our school site. That is my hope um, because, again, between the two of them, all of us, it's our entire team, but between the two of them, they're really the proactive people. We brief every morning, every morning. Who are we checking in with today? Who are the kids that we're going to do safety plans with or do a check-in or a wellness check-in? Or who are we going to catch at the end of the day? So they're, they're crucial positions to sustain the positive behavior culture at the highest level that we have right now going on at our school. Um, well, you are advocating yeah. in the right place because these are two of the seven people who approve our budget, and Andres is representing the superintendent who will present that budget. So this is great information for us awesome. to be able to know about. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that the last piece? No, let's... We're, One more. That's it. This is Go PBS in action. Again, we work together to, as with our teachers, our parents, our staff, our students, just to create an overall positive school environment. Yeah. Thank well, you. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations on your award. Stick around, please. We're going to do questions for all the schools at the end, but we wanted to see all three levels. And so with that, we will invite up Markham Middle School, who I think is online. Let's give it up for Brooklyn Avenue. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing presentation. And we will go next to our middle school and finally to our high school. Can we bring up Markham, please? I see some teammates joining us. Let me switch the slides. And because they're on Zoom, I'll just mention we have um, Ms. Kawasaki, the principal, Mr. Monk, AP, Ms. Lewis, the uh, BSAP RJ teacher, I think are all joining us on Zoom. I think I just saw you a couple hours ago, so <laughs> good to see you all again. <laughs> Welcome. What's happening at Markham? Yes, well, thank you uh, for having us today. We're always excited to share um, the good work that we're doing at Markham um, and how it's impacted our community. Uh, first, we'll just go ahead and, and start off with the, we did kind of introduce us, but we'll start off with a brief introduction as, uh, of the team um, and we'll discuss how we define and create success here at Markham and the evaluative tools that we use and um, areas that we hope to see strengthened. So I'll start off, uh, I'm Thomas Monk, I'm assistant principal uh, over discipline and counseling uh, here at Markham. Um, I actually started off here as the restorative justice uh, coordinator for a few years before moving up into admin. And my name is Brittany Lewis. I am a the restorative justice teacher here for Markham. I've been here for uh, seven years. I am a product of LAUSD, actually part of the zero tolerance policy. So the uh, <laughs> restorative practice is super important to me. Um, but yes, I love the great work we do here at Markham. Um, so pretty much uh, we know that PBIS shapes the environment. So in traditional discipline and behavioral systems, we like to blame everyone who is driving, but in this case, everyone doing the behavior. Uh, we like to think that we can pretty much fix the student and eliminate the behavior, but we know that that's not the case. Just like driving, it's uh, actual systems that causes chaos, the bad roads, people get off at the same time. In this case, 
the behavior system we know shapes the environment. So here in Markham, this is what PBIS um, looked at. We look at the data, and in particular, we look at the student cell surveys. We look at the tier fidelity inventory, and as far as discipline. We know that the discipline referral, we have a strict procedure and process that we try to make consistent throughout the school. We have expectations and rules that we try to make sure that are explicitly, explicitly taught to students. Um, and that way they know which, accept, which behavior is acceptable. And as, well, as far as an acknowledgement system to encourage and model the appropriate behavior and the restorative consequences that um, are developed and used to encourage inappropriate behavior. So here is what uh, the action looks like in our community. Here at Markham, we provide lots of tier one opportunities for students to pretty much build relationships. It's very important that we try to identify students by name. We also are at the gate greeting students as well as at the exits when they're leaving. We um, provide safe passes, positive phone call home, check-ins and out, and we clearly go through the expectations with every student. Inside our classroom, um, the PBIS, our restorative practices, are centered around the circles agreement and community um, building. Uh, we also have a monarch room. Majority of our, our classroom have calm corners for students to uh, take a moment, whether they need a break um, before they move on to the class, but they have that opportunity where they can um, sit to the side and even just build these relationships with teachers. Um, tying into these cell lessons. So initially we did use the PBIS um, lessons that were provided through by the district, but as time went on, we decided to tweak them to our students. So in these uh, weekly cell lessons, these are where we teach the expectations to students, um, going over how they should act in the um, hallways and the breezeway, the lunch areas, even the restrooms. Um, every day uh, of our slides have a different um, topic, whether it's Monday with the counselor, Tuesday is Focus and Reflect Tuesday. We gear Wednesdays um, specifically for Rethink Ed. We do circles on Thursday and college Friday as well. Um, in classrooms or advisories or even in the library, we do special topics such as mental health, self-care, and even topics of friendships. Student engagement is a big one here, and we try to schedule activities throughout the year, such as different club rush. We also um, have new this year, so, um, band, I'm sorry, the drum line and cheer for students. We have a Project Lick Book Club, a student council that meets every Monday. Um, we have Fun Friday activities, and again, these college events. So student engagement is a big one here, and we try to spread it out. Uh, when it comes to acknowledging and rewarding our students, this is something we we love. We love showing our students all the great work that they're doing. So whether it's caught being kind, where teachers can catch students doing kind acts, or random acts of kindness where students can acknowledge other students for the kind deeds. We give out certificates, um, rewards, and incentives. Kids love incentives. We know how they are. And as far as, um, we also like to add filters. Celebrations are huge here. We like to acknowledge the moments that matter the most to our students' cultural backgrounds and bring them new experiences. So whether we're having spirit weeks, um, students and staff versus competitions like this tomorrow, we're having our annual Turkey Bowl where we're um, undefeated as staff, we wanna say that. Um, also we have like bullying prevention contests, uh, problem of the week, door decorating contests. We just try to spread the, the, um, the cheer and the spirit around campus. So um, not only do our staff invest in our lives as the students here on campus, but we most importantly, we try to invest and show our love and um, support for students outside of school hours. So majority of our staff here try to participate in any aspect of our students, whether it's some of their boys and girls club activities, weekend um, events that they may have, we just try to be a part of them, not um, during school, not only during school, but outside of school hours as well. All right, so aside from all of the fun stuff, right, because we like to have a good time, um, there also is a lot of uh, requirement in order, to, in order to do this to, to have strong systems in place. So I want to go over with the work that we're doing to provide those systems. 
our discipline policy, um, we want to be very clear in, in the expectations of our dis discipline policy. Um, of course, as we mentioned earlier, um, it was discussed about having the tiered system. So we have our tiered system. Our teachers know, our students know, they're aware of the expectations um, and how the behaviors um, are addressed. Um, and you know the, the motions that we go through in addressing those tiered behaviors. All right. Um, our restorative action. Let's see. Actually, do we skip one? There we go. Um, our restorative consequences guide. Um, this is again just a reference for teachers, for counselors, our team to know uh, how we are going to address uh, behaviors and that they are in line with our beliefs about restoration and um, our community when it comes to harm and the breaches of such. Okay, there we go. Let's see, do we skip another one? Sorry, go back to the other one. Okay, um, again, uh, the different things we do as a staff, again, what we talked about ourselves as being the team, we're really just the leads and everyone, uh, all of our stakeholders are a part of this team. And we have our monthly PBIS meetings uh, for which we you know, have all of our stakeholders uh, are invited and able to give insight um, as to any of the concerns. We review data, um, you know, discipline data, um, anything that pertains to uh, the culture of our school. Um, and we take this data and we apply it in our professional developments. We have a weekly support staff meetings, uh, we have our wellness rooms, which is uh, gifted to us from Change Reaction uh, for the hard work that our teachers do, all of our staff. Um, and we have team building activities. All right. And what has been the key to our success here at Markham? Uh, we attribute four keys to our success. Um, we have our core beliefs that school discipline and uh, SEL cannot be uh, separate, but must you know be inclusive of one another. Um, our data drives the decisions that we make uh, for our students. Uh, we must evolve and learn. We must continue to learn and grow. Obviously, you know we're we're lifelong learners, and that's what we promote to our kids. Um, and finally, fidelity, fidelity to our principles, uh, to our practices, and especially as they relate to consistent and fair firm consequences. Now, we know that we're doing our job, a good job, um, if these are the things that are true for our school community. Right? We have a safe, positive, inclusive environment, little to no discipline referrals. Um, you know, this is where we strive to be. And uh, most importantly, strong relationships. All right, so here uh, we need your help to take our um, our roles from good to great. So at the top of our wish list, we're asking for the district to support us with expanding these opportunities for students. We we don't have too much money for incentive or even these experiences that we want to open our children's um, eyes to. On top of that, we need help taking PBIS from home. I'm um, from school to home. So we do all this great work here. It's uh, we, we're struggling. We're basically just taking this home to students. Um, we try to encourage them to have these sort of circles and conversations, but then it's a different story when a lot of these students go home. So we need them to, um, we need support with reaching out to the families and connecting to build these networks and provide incentives for families as well for engagement. Um, so again, remembering, because this is a quote that we uh, hear all the time, every child deserves a champion and an adult who never gives up and understands the power of connecting and assisting that they can become the best person they can be. Thank you so much, Team Edwin Markham Middle School. And as we applaud them, we'll invite our Santee High School team to come on down, getting the full perspective K-12. Hearing a lot of themes around our prevention, our tier two, our tier three, and just the clarity of expectations. So appreciate you all for that. Let's bring up Santee's slides and let's hear from the team. Uh, I'll let you all introduce yourselves as you jump on in. 
All right, good evening, everybody. I am the proud principal of Santee, uh, Violeta Ruiz. And today with me, I have the following members, and I'll have them introduce themselves, and then we'll go through our slide deck. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Helen Tizon. I'm the restorative justice teacher at Santee. I've been at Santee since 2006. Hello, my name is uh, Ilmar Rodriguez, Mr. Rodriguez. I'm the Prevention Support Coordinator. I've been at Santee since 2007. Good evening, my name is Kimberly Garrett. I'm one of the assistant principals with Santee and I've been at Santee for five years. All right, so what really guides our work at Santee is our vision statement. So this is our why, and a big component of our vision statement is collaboration, not only amongst our staff, but with our community and our students. And our mission statement is uh, tied to our vision statement, and I highlighted we provide opportunities for educational growth and family involvement to our community. So that educational growth is not just for our students, but also for our staff and our families and even our community partners. And our Santee belief is we all believe that all students can learn at high levels and we all take that responsibility. So regardless of what our students' race is or what their abilities are or their language classification, we all take that responsibility to create a welcoming environment and create lessons and provide them with the supports necessary to be successful. So Santee is located in South LA, is one of the biggest high school in our region with about 1,687 kids. We might have more, we had more enrollments today. Um, and so it takes a team, it really does take a team. Our BSAP group calls it, it takes a village, right? So I am the principal, but I cannot handle every single discipline case. So we have a large team on site with Ms. Garrett as our point as assistant principal. We have two intervention prevention support coordinators that really support with tracking the data and providing supports for our teachers and our students as well as those restorative um, interventions for our students. We also have our climate advocate who is Ms. Williams and as and Ms. Tizon is here as our RJ teacher advisor and this is a position that we brought back to Santee after COVID because we noticed that a lot of our kids who were in ninth grade were mad at each other for stuff they did in sixth grade. So um, that time apart and we just needed to have a reset and refocus on how to engage our students and we are a partnership for Los Angeles school and so so we also have restorative um, community leads, restorative justice community leads through them. And so we have teachers who are in the classroom that are being provided with support to continue to grow their path in restorative practices. Ms. Garrett. All right, so we have a progressive intervention flow chart here at Santee. We, want, we believe that all, all behavior should start in the classroom. So our teachers are our first line of defense. We try to have conversations with our students. We want our teachers to give warnings. They can do after school interventions. We talk about seat changes. We try to give them strategies that they can use in the classroom to counter some of the tier one behaviors that we focus on. If those behaviors are not able to be dealt with in the classroom, then we have a, hier excuse me, a hierarchy that they go to. If it's an academic problem, then we, fo we follow to the academic counselors. SEL goes to either myself, the school climate advocate, the RJs, or the deans. Attendance issues, we have two amazing PSAs. <laughs> they handle our attendance issues. And then our mental health, we have two PSWs on site. Um, and then for there, if, if none of these can work, then they move over to our administrative team. But we really try to focus on dealing with the tier ones so that we don't have a lot of things that are moved over to our tier threes. Thank you. That's it? Oh, okay. So um, all the decision making and the planning were based on data that it's all data driven we have our we develop our own survey at school and we also use the school experience survey to decide what professional development we're going to provide our teachers and just um, one of the best practices whether outside or inside the classroom is modeling to our students so we model the use of I statement 
in, in the classroom and with our staff. Also, we promote the four to one ratio, which is connection over uh, correction school-wide, so in the classroom and with the feedback that we provide our teachers when we do our classroom observations. Then we also utilize the use of the restorative questions. And then also in our morning announcements, we make sure that we promote joy and wellness over the PA announcement system. And also one, um, one of the CTA goal strategies last year of Santi is to create and promote um, opportunities to establish relationships with our students and parents and our community partners on campus. And through that, we have this active, uh, we have a very active school culture team that meets ev that meet every month. Um, we include all our community partners. We have our student representative there um, to, uh, to collaborate um, with our activities in, on campus. And we made sure that we acknowledge them and they are listened to. Um, so, next. All right, so the benefits of restorative justice, so why are we applying this? Because it, we, see how, we see it works. We were able to minimize our um, referrals and we also prevent and, and prevent and enhance our methods to, to address harmful behaviors. And also we find um, resolutions for conflicting, uh, conf uh, resolutions for conflicts be between students. And we believe that restorative thinking is a shift from punishment-oriented thinking and making everyone feel that they belong. Because we believe that when students do, when students feel good, they do good. Okay, so why does it work at SNT? So at the beginning of the summer, uh, during uh, the school year, uh, we have orientations for our parents, for our students, so they know the expectations when they come to Santee. We have, uh, we actually go to present to every single classroom so the teachers and the students understand what do we expect from them. And to also get to know us, to get to know us so they, when they have a problem, they could always come to an adult on campus. So we do, do, we do classroom observations also. Uh, we, we do presentations to our staff in case they want to start practicing their, uh, their RG, restorative justice practices. We, do, we, we offer professional development training for, for our, our, our teachers. Uh, so we do community building circles uh, in order to uh, resolve any conflicts in the classroom or in school or even in the internet because a lot of the problems that our, our kids actually, a lot of the problems start in the internet, believe it or not. Uh, so we also uh, have a great uh, culture group. So a culture team at, at school uh, which uh, does activities and some of these activities are now not fun, now only fun, but these are activities that adults, students get engaged. So we start building uh, relationships with um, our staff, our teachers, especially uh, as Santee, because a lot of our teachers are very di uh, diverse. So by doing these activities, they get to know where our students come from, the, knowing that, you know, uh, South LS is, it is sometimes it's a challenging place for our kids when they come into our school. So they come in with a lot of challenges. So it's a great way to make connections. Uh, and building, build, by doing that, you also build trust. So they know who to go to, uh, and they uh, so they could feel safe at school. Uh, uh, so they know they also know that there's an adult on campus that cares about them. We uh, as uh, we also do a lot of classroom observations to support those teachers, to support what are the needs, uh, so they could focus more on the lesson to. Uh, reduce a lot of behavior. Instead of them dealing with behavior, we <coughs> offer them strategies that they could use in the classroom. Uh, we do check-ins with, uh, uh, with our campus aides, making sure that they're vigilant throughout the day so our, our, our students feel safe and uh, they feel safe at school. 
Uh, that way, it decreases the misbehaviors in the classroom. And uh, we, uh, one more thing I want to mention is uh, that we have actually, actually Saturday Success Academy where you might have a student that might be behaving, uh, misbehaving throughout the week, and we, so we, they could come and do uh, assignments. It's not like back in the days where you make the students pick up trash and all that, so we're getting away from all of the punishment. So the students actually come and do homework, assignments. Uh, we actually work with our uh, uh, college uh, counselor. They could, uh, seniors could come and work on uh, uh, requirements for college, getting, getting them ready for college. We also work with decreasing our physical altercations because of some of the things that we put in place with the community building, with the RJs, we've seen a decrease in our physical altercations at Santee. Our conflict resolution, our restorative justice circles, those are things, it's an automatic. If we have students that do have a physical altercation, we assess the situation, but we make sure that the students do do an RJ in a harm circle before they return back. We have found that once we do that, we're able to minimize the problems where we don't have repeats in the past, we would have a, we'd have a fight, they come back, they, they do an RJ, then we back up, we back doing the same thing over again. But once we RJ'd and we did these things, we saw that the kids got to able to work out their problems and we had less repeat offenders in these same situations. Some of our challenges. We can do it okay. together. <laughs> so go ahead. Sometimes we discover things a little too late. So um, Santee is a big school. So there are things we find out too late, maybe a fight occurred, but once we do find out, we try to do our best to make sure that we minimize those situations so that they don't become reoccurrences. And sometimes, as our former colleagues mentioned, is a parental support, right? So making sure that parents understand uh, what, we're, what interventions we have in place so that they don't feel like nothing is being done, but something is actually being done to prevent future um, recurrences of the same event. Then our student buy-in. A lot of our students that have been in Santee, our juniors and our seniors, they've been a part of RJs for the last four years. It's getting buy-in from our ninth and our 10th graders that may not have come from schools that had RJs and did these type of interventions. So getting the buy-ins from those students have been our biggest challenges working with our freshmen and our students that are new to Santee. And then sometimes, uh, as some of our staff members will sometimes say, well, nothing's being done, the student's back in my class, right? So it's following up and really working with our staff and understanding that something is being done. And if a child is behaving in a certain way, there's usually an exterior motive as to why something is happening. And so we can't always tell you everything that we do, but just know that everything is addressed. And then uh, some persistent problems that we have. So we do a great job in keeping a safe campus. However, there are exterior factors and community factors. We are in South LA, we're on Washington and Maple between Los Angeles and Maple Street on Maple and 23rd. And so there are times where safe passages where our students are traveling to and from school where they experience theft. There's gangs in the neighborhood, they're approached by exterior motives. Um, so a lot of our kids uh, sometimes bring knives brass knuckles, pepper spray onto our campus, not because they want to use it against someone, but because it is their protection. And so um, we've noticed that now we do end up finding a lot of these things because our kids want to keep a safe school, but our students know that they're not being searched, right? And so they feel like they can get away with it more. And our parents have asked us, well, can you search our students? So we have to kind of work with our parents and let them know that unless we have a reason why we're searching our students, we can't necessarily do that. We're also in an area of Los Angeles where we have a lot of homeless encampments around our area. So sometimes our unhoused Angelinos make their way onto our campus. And so I'll run, I'll walk over um, with some support. And so whereas before we did have school police that would support us with unhoused, um, they do now, but usually it's it's me, Mr. Rodriguez, or a campus aide that walk over, and we're lucky that these unhoused Angelinos have not had any weapons on them, um, but their mental state isn't always there. So for us, um, that's where school police used to be our number one go-to, not for the issues within our site, but the, those exterior factors that made it onto our campus. All right, thank you. Thank you, Santee. <clears throat> 
And I'll say Ms. Goldberg asked me to invite you all because she felt the uh, deep presence of restorative justice on your campus. So for all three schools, thank you so much. You all had the highest number of restorative practices for each of the school levels across the district. So we're proud to see some of the great work that's happening and hope to share this beyond the committee meeting today. Um, we're going to move to committee member questions of any of the schools here. Um, so if you're online, feel free to raise your hand. And I do apologize. I had an immovable appointment, so I'll have to head out in a few minutes and Dr. Rebus will chair our last few minutes of the conversation and our public comment. So committee members, questions, our student, parent, or colleagues up here? Sorry? Limited? No, Dr. Rebus? Oh, yes, Natalie, thank you, go hard. Yeah, hi, so I've realized that many of these schools provide presentations for students regarding the PBIS and restorative practices. And my question has something to do with being able to connect more with um, more appropriate resources for students because I feel like there's a certain amount of choices and actions we can take to improve safety and behaviors at school but in a matter that doesn't involve like criminal criminalizing students for others actions. So I guess my question is, is there any kind of alternate route that we could take action in to make us to make schools safer? It's a great question, um, and all of our school teams are, are back there, but if you have thoughts, feel free to, to come on up. Um, we did pass a resolution at the end of last year, Dr. Rivas and I co-authored around community-based safety, and we're working with um, Mr. Chait and team around additional partners that can help with the safe passage that you heard about from Santee, that can respond to crises on campus with um, community members who are trusted in the neighborhood. And so we're, we're working together on how we can grow that in LA Unified, um, but this is an issue we constantly here, which is why we have this committee. Uh, safety continues to be a challenge in so many ways, and it's great to see what schools are doing to prevent it, intervening when there are issues on campus, and we definitely have a community responsibility often beyond our campuses, um, just given everything that our kids are living in. So I think it's an ongoing question that you're raising, Natalie, with not, unfortunately, a quick silver bullet answer. Any other questions from my colleagues? So we are getting close to our community uh, public comment anyway, so we will go ahead and turn to Mr. McLean. We have our 10 public comment speakers for two minutes each. Thank you one more time to all of our uh, schools and presenters today. You've given us a lot of information to think about. So appreciate you all coming down this afternoon. And with that, we'll turn to our speakers. Okay, so the first speaker is Ms. Diana Guillen. Ms. Diana Guillen, come on up. Uh, Ms. Guillen is going to speak in Spanish, and if you'd like to hear what she's saying in English as she's speaking it, please put your hands up and then we will be able to pass out these headsets so that you can experience the wonder of simultaneous translation. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Diana Guillén. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Diana Guillén. And I have been the DLAC chairperson for the last four years. And today I know that you're talking about safety and about all the restorative strategies to support our students. And I think that all this is a good implementation, but there is one thing that I want to highlight that when you did the change that you took away or took take away the time that we have here instead of three minutes, two minutes to you said it's for dem, uh, to democracy before it was three minutes. Now it's on two minutes and it's only 10 people now. So it you really don't want to listen to the public. I'm seeing this in this subcommittee. The parents are very concerned due to school safety. Why? Because they want you want the school police to be away more and more we need the police inside and you take them away even more there's stabbings there's drugs there's fights maybe you don't have children and you don't know what's going on inside but that is what's going on and your political decisions are not helping our community really in reality we as parents think that we have come here to speak but i don't know what do you need go and visit the schools see for yourself you say that the uh, police, the school police criminalize the students, but go and see 
Go to prisons and see how many youth are there. It's not because of school police. It is because there is no discipline in the schools. Every single time it escalates more and more. The police is just a way to stop some things. Like we were talking before, sometimes even as an adult, you see an, as an adult, you don't see the police. You don't cross the light. But then if you don't see them, you do. That's what's happening with the students. Students are crossing the red lights because they don't see discipline that stops them. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Mr. Juan Magandi, I see you're out there. Come on up, please, and you'll have two minutes to speak once you begin. Good afternoon. They say that the politicians do not move unless that they see that their neighborhood is on fire and to make a campaign so that they're not reelected. And on the flip side, things go okay. It doesn't make sense if we have the unions, we have the organizations, and we have the political operators who will always have a campaign so that you are elected. The serious problem today is that it's interesting to know that the school comes to talk about the wonderful things that happen in Santee, but they don't really listen about what happens in Santee. They, they think that taking a weapon is normal for a student to have, and it, there's no consequence. I'm a asking myself, would you allow me to bring a weapon here, even if I say it's for my own protection, but I don't ha have the inten intention to use it against somebody? That is a logic that we are not seeing. We, in this moment, the parents at the Cochrane, parents, we have the police back in the uh, school site, but they want to have them as babysitters, as pets, knowing that there's so many people, people that have consumed fentanyl and they have been taken. We have a person that passed away. There's people that are dying and we know perfectly. And those that take care of the, uh, the where the kids play, the assistants, they know that all those consequences are done on in Instagram. There's a little bit of a group of people, of kids, and they fight. And you're talking that in this January, I think that it would be the legacy for Ms. Goldberg that you will give in to the police because you think that it's the police that criminalizes. But who criminalizes is the principal because they're the ones that report. The police just does a description of the facts. You need to take the decision and how you will treat the parents and the kids. And that's not being said. It is so beautiful when you name a director of the school police with the only objective of destroying the same police because they do not recognize the, the rights of the parents. I don't think that you take into consideration the safety because it's a second civil right. Okay, we've got Norma Gonzalez. I see you're on the line. Norma Gonzalez, please press star six to unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes to speak once you begin. Norma Gonzalez. Sí, buenas tardes. ¿Me escuchan? Sí, sí, escucha. Good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Norma Gonzalez, and I am a mother of four students that attend this Los Angeles Unified. Everything looks very well with restorative justice, but in the East and Region East, it's been happening. Something's been complicated with the schools in Southeast High, the Middle and High School. In Southeast Middle, there the students evermore are out of control. And we have a new principal, Mr. Gomez, and he says that the that the table is set, that that's not his priority because who has to take matters into it. And then this Tuesday, there was four kids that had um, BB guns, and that's what happened. And then then the it's a hot potato between the South East Middle with the Southeast High School. And then I think that. Like we have said many times that day on the Tuesday with the coffee with the principal during the middle, he said it didn't matter that he had it under control. And yes, we understand that academically, it's academics are first, but if we don't have safety, our students are not are going to be able to achieve academically. I think that that year, the students really showed us of the power that they have of being out of control without having a school officer. Ms. Tania, I think that you, Ms. Rivas, as well, need to take matters into your hands and just don't have it uh, 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 um, 
certification. It's not something just to be okay with the between you and the um, unions. We want the school police so that the students can really meet their academic goals and are able to meet the goals that you are establishing. At the end of the day, if they don't meet them, it is because everything stays under the bridge or just like the principal under that table. And I think that you need to take matters into your own hands because then after there will be students that will uh, die with true weapons or maybe there were true weapons and you don't wanna say so. Thank I you think that you need time. to take- We appreciate your time. Uh, let's see, Maria Luisa Palma, I see you're on the line. Maria Palma, please press star six to unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes to speak once you begin. Maria Palma. My name is Maria Luisa Palma speaking with Oleada Inc., a nonprofit organization. Your presentation provided lots of terminology and processes in detail, but to parents, this is meaningless. None of this addresses the basic question. Is there effective discipline on school campuses? We see the news reports and the stabbing at Van Nuys High School and other reports. At my school, we've heard about examples, parents witnessing students cutting class, using drugs such as marijuana or snorting substances right outside the school fence. They saw students breaking into a vehicle. Students, their children don't use the bathrooms at school because of smoking and drug use. In your June of 2023 board resolution, where did you envision that authentic parents would provide you with their perspective? And these would be parents not affiliated with these so-called community organizations, but real parents. At schools, they play CADA. They try to talk to us about the number of campus aides that they have. At the region, a parent was told to participate on district committees to voice his concerns. Today at DLAC meeting, multiple parents asked the school safety questions, but they were sent back. They were told, told, talk to your school, talk to your region. Parents are not even told about the existence of this committee, but even this committee is not an open forum. This is just one way. Now we only have 10 speakers, two minutes each. The chair, Ms. Ortiz Franklin, decision to limit the number of speakers here is limiting parental voices. So where is parent outreach on safety? Where are parents supposed to speak? Not parents elect, selected by your offices or your administrators, but real parents, not scripted by your team. Where do we get an open forum to get answers, two-way communication to our safety questions? In this current climate, which you created this environment, you remove the authority figures in the body of the school police. You remove the limits to youth disorder, leading them to habits in criminal thinking and criminal behavior. Now, where are academics in all of this? If there are any academics, academics, it is in spite of the lack of rampant run, lack of discipline at the school site. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Damian Winfrey, I see you're on the line. Damian Winfrey, please press star six to unmute yourself, and you'll have two minutes to speak once you begin. Damian Winfrey. All right, hello, I'm Damien, a student of Marbonne High School, as well as a student, um, or a leader in Students Deserve. So we have distributed over 5,000 wristbands for the awareness and progression in the campaign to defund school police and implement these funding into our students with programs, you know, as, uh, you know, like Safe Passes and BSAP, the Black Student Achievement Program. While students like myself have the serene sense with our new Safe Passage program, other BSAP Group 1 schools are still lacking. This is the message you send not only to the future generation and their parents, but as well implies what you're supporting. LASPD is still receiving $60 million in educational funding when students are still being proven to be victims. 17 years old, gunshot wound by school police. Students with the proper fund are proven to see their belonging and belief of, of their future overcoming tragedies. As a senior in high school, I have a lot on my plate and even more to look forward to, even more time to look forward to. With the ones I love in my life, most of the time has been cut short. Facing a current death that remains in time. Coming from work, being sure we have enough food to fill the plate. Coming home late in time, worrying if my time would be took. Hoping, hoping those that lay and wait to see my face don't lead with hate. Sleepless nights, forcing precious time and dedication towards my brightest mornings. BSAP has led me to understand not all weeds in the garden are bad. Some weeds are as needed and, and as delightful like dandelions. Without the proper support, I, I would have whacked roots of trees instead of weeds that strengthen me. 
with the right motive in our community, we build our communities. And that is why we need BSAP community help and community. Not every problem can be asked for. Not every problem can be asked for help. A community with genuine support knows how to lead just, just by the expression of a face and hearing of a calling. Instead of criminalizing, labeling, and the extortion on our youth, defund the school police and implement funding in important programs like BSAP and Safe Passage Program because they understand and have a better guidance in times when we need help. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, uh, Romy Griego, I see you're on the line. Romy Griego, please press star six to unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes to speak once you begin. Romy Griego. Uh, can you hear me? We can, if you just speak up a little bit, you're not coming uh, through very clearly. Okay, awesome. Um, my name is Romy Griego and I'm a junior at Igor High School and I'm a leader in Students Deserve. For over a year now, I and many other students organizing um, around safe pass programs due to an increase of school police before and after school. Last year after school, there was a fight between two students at the conjoining park of my school and it led to two shots being fired. This was a very scary and stressful situation for everyone at Eagle Rock, one that could have been prevented if safe passage programs were invested in. This led to an even scarier situation, which was an increase of school police before and after school. I now see at least two cop cars at each entrance of my school and one at the park. There are cops standing outside of their cars doing nothing but watching students, intimidating students, and scaring students. There are over 2,000 students at my school, the majority of them having to take the bus or walk to school. We don't want cops to be given the job to keep us safe on our way to and from school because we see what these cops are doing. We've seen them put our peers in danger, and it needs to end. If safe passages are fully implemented and funded, in schools across the district, students will actually know what safety feels like. We'll be able to witness what holistic and humane prevention and de-escalation looks like. We'll be able to finally feel safe and be taken care of. Because safety isn't cops with guns on their waist waiting for us to mess up. Safety isn't cops watching students get stabbed outside of schools. Safety isn't cops breaking their own policy and pepper spraying innocent students all in the name of breaking up a fight. Safety is our community taking care of the whole child the mental, emotional, and physical well-being of the students. Safe passage programs are a way for us to feel safe by the people in our community that welcome us and love us. It's a way to ensure our safety in a way where we feel taken care of. Safe passage programs are a way to invest in our lives, not the cops that are putting them in danger. Thank you. Thank you for your time. There are four folks who signed up to speak remotely, but who I do not see, who I see are not signed in yet. I'll call the name just in case you happen to be in the audience. Uh, Roy Horowitz, are you here in the audience? You're not online. Kendra Carpenter, are you here? Jenneth Galindo. Okay, and Maria Mayorga. All right, that completes um, public comment. Well, thank you for all the uh, public commenters. Comment, commenters, is that a word? I don't know. <laughs> everyone who spoke here today, thank you for everyone who's here present and everyone who presented. Have a wonderful good afternoon. This concludes uh, the School Safety and Climate Committee. Thank you so much.